I'm so glad to have uh, Bishop E.C. with this morning. He, he's a missionary we support in Nigeria. How long have you been uh, a part of uh, Resonate and connected with Resonate? How many years? Since 1954. 1984. And now you are a U.S. citizen. Come on. And pray, pray. Congratulations. So I'm just going to allow him to just share for a few moments what's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in his world, so that we can be connected to what he's doing as we pray and we give monthly to him. All right, take it away. God bless you. Do I, do I keep this? Yes. I'm going to grab this. Good morning, everybody. Do you speak English or German? What do you speak? <laughs> Shout hallelujah. I'm so glad to be here today. First of all, I'm bringing greetings to you from Nigeria. Um, I give thanks to Pastor Jeff and his wife Sarah and the elders of this church for still keeping me alive in this church. Some of you that are here don't know me. Just call me Easy. Do you understand what I mean? That makes it easy for you. I am a servant of the Lord in Nigeria. I'm also here in the United States visiting friends and churches that are in partnership with us in the ministry. And uh, I just want to let you know that you are special to us. This is my home church in America. Yes. Hopefully, I may live for the next 150 years, but when I die, <laughs> Some of you will come to Nigeria for my funeral. <laughs> Do you hear what I say? Yes. Can somebody say amen? Yes. I'm not dying. I'm going to live long. <laughs> I'm married. My wife's name is Joy. She always come here, but she's in Nigeria now. Just like Pastor Jeff has mentioned, I've been in the United States for going to Nigeria, coming back with what they call green card, and it was too hard on me. And this has taken seven years. But by the grace of God, the month of June this year, I was sworn in as a U.S. citizen. <laughs> now, some of you may not know why this is important in my life and in my ministry. Because some of you have not traveled outside to know what's happening. Most, I met an American here whom I was discussing something special and he asked me, where is New York? I asked him, don't you know where New York is? He said, New York is in Africa. <laughs> I looked at him and said, what ignorance is this? <laughs> he, does, he doesn't know. But it's good for you to know. So, this citizenship I required gives me an opportunity to preach the gospel in over 100 countries of the world without visa. I receive invitations from other countries, Western world like London, Scotland, but I couldn't go because I don't, I don't, you can't get the visa. But the US passport is purely international. It gives an open door to go and preach in over 100 countries of the world. That was why I kept myself patient to get it, and by the grace of God, I am qualified. Nigeria is in Africa. Africa is not in Nigeria. <laughs> we are preaching the gospel, planting churches, establishing orphanages, taking care of people uh, where the people that have been displayed, displaced, displaced by the Boko Haram. This is jihadist, Islamic jihadists that had their root in Nigeria, killing Christians, beheading them, burning down churches, burning down homes. And what you do is people that escaped, the Christians that escaped there, will try to build some shelter, little shelter for them in the bush to live there. No food, no water. We try as much as we can to provide something to keep them alive. These are ministry in Nigeria. Some of you may not understand what we are suffering by persecution from the Islamic jihadists. 
I pray that that will not happen in the United States. Pray about it, it will not happen here. It's dangerous. It's not safe. People cannot move freely. In Nigeria, they kidnap people, kidnap women, rape them in the public, and kill them. And the government does not do anything because they are in the government. They are sponsored by the government. But God is good. Can somebody say God is good? We are overcomers. We still preach the gospel and souls have been saved. And we establish them by discipleship, teaching new people to be strong in the Lord, to have faith in Christ. The Christianity life in Nigeria is not what we see in America. You are living what I call under the comfort zone. We are living in what I call disaster zone. Disaster. But we are alive. And we are, thank you for your, your prayers. So many of you that have seen me and known me praying for your missionaries. It is your prayers that have sustained us. It's your financial giving that has sustained us. It's your concern that has kept us alive today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, I want to let you know that we are still moving forward in the planting of churches and medical clinics. Most America is blessed. Can somebody say amen? People have headache, they die in Nigeria. Small thing they die because there's no medical facilities. The people in the government, the politicians, be embezzling money in, into their pocket. They don't care for the people. As I'm talking to you now, over 70% of Nigerians are living in poverty, no food, no medical facilities, no water to drink. Light will go off for six months. Power light for six months. Roads are not paved. But God has blessed you that all these things are functioning very well in this country. So I'm here to let you know that I'm still serving the Lord and I appreciate your support and prayers to our ministry. Pastor Jeff and Sarah, thank you very much. I just want to close a place to give you a word of exhortation from the book of First. Corinthians chapter 15. You know, we live, we live by the word of God. It says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, or, yeah, 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Somebody say unmovable. <laughs> say it very loudly. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Can somebody say amen? amen. Be steadfast. Be strong in the Lord. Don't allow the things happening in the world to shake you out. Don't allow the, the, the present predicament that's afflicting the young generations to affect you. Be steadfast. Read your Bible every day. I tell people, if you are going to be a member in my church, you must read your Bible. If you don't read your Bible, you cannot be my member. <laughs> because God will show you more than what I can show you. So I want to encourage you, be steadfast, and thank you for your support to this young pastor, lively young man. Come along, my dear. Come along. <laughs> thank you so much. God bless you. Yeah, I, before you leave, let's, let, we want to pray for Bishop E.C. because you can hear what the kind of things that he is uh, encountering, and uh, it feels pretty foreign to us. Like, what? What? All that kind of stuff. But uh, that's why I love bringing people here for us to hear, hey, all the world doesn't look like Lucas, Texas, and, uh, and we need to be praying and giving, and we're going we're gonna to give Bishop E.C. a gift today as well, but... But, and if you feel like you, need, you want to give towards this, you can do that on, on our website. But come on, let's just lift up. Lord, I just thank you for Bishop E.C., Lord. I pray, Lord, for the protection of his family, of his life, of his wife, Lord, his children, Lord. We just pray for protection around them, Father. I pray the boldness of God, 
Lord, just continue to instill that boldness. Lord, we pray for angelic beings, Lord, to protect them, Lord, everywhere they go, Father, as they share the gospel, as they bring the truth of Jesus, Lord. God, release, Father, new, uh, I, I, I just pray, new levels of an anointing and new levels of provision in their, in their ministry, Father. And, Lord, as he travels around the world, over, Lord, God, open up doors, Father. And, Lord, I pray the wind of the Spirit blow through him, Father, and strengthen him, Lord, for many, many years to come. Lord, I pray for the strength of Caleb. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. And, and he's going to be at uh, the Watts's, uh small group today so if you want to go to that you can and hear him he's going to be talking to him and good stuff all right well it feels forever i have not been here preaching i mean we did god stories last week but it's been a while since i've shared god's word i'm super excited about that let's see what time is we're in good shape all right well, welcome everybody. Welcome online. Um, who's ready for a fall yet? Oh my goodness! I'm gonna take this. I am so ready for fall. We were just talking. I mean, I'm just like, who's ready for hoodies? Yeah. Oh goodness. Good stuff. Hey, we're we're in a series. Let me get right right to it. Um, called uh, we're starting today. Take your place. Take your place. It's based upon four prophetic words that we have uh, for the year. Pursue. We're going to pursue God with all our heart. Take your place. Uh, I'll share what that's about today. Kingdom marriages. God wants to restore, and not just restore, but strengthen our marriages that we already have. And then kingdom families. Um, not, first of all, discipling our children and our families, but also the family of God. So we're going we're gonna to be, uh, we've, been, we've covered a few of those. Take your place is about stepping into your authority, using your gifts, not running from the call of God on your life. And here's the tagline. If you don't take your place, someone or something will fill the space. Come on, say that again with me. Everybody, if you don't take your place, someone or something will fill the space. So we'll be talking about that for a few weeks. Um, and that can mean a lot of things. Dads, if you don't take your place as head of the home and spiritual authority, someone or something will fill the space. Sometimes it's mom having to fill the space of being the, the spiritual authority in the house and being the, you know, having to step in when that's not her call. Or it could be the culture. The culture fills the space. The media fills the space. The shows fill the space. Stranger things, whatever it is that they're watching, it fills the space. If dad, you don't step in and fill that space, or maybe... It's being a spiritual leader in your school, teenagers. Step in and fill that space. Start a Bible study. Maybe it's starting a small group here. Maybe it's serving somewhere. I don't know. Um, but this isn't just about being a good role model here we're talking about. We're talking about knowing your God-given authority that God's called you to and uh, stepping into that place of authority and advancing God's kingdom. And I want you to remember... There's more than two forces in the earth, right? We think it's just God and Satan. There's more than two forces. There's God, Satan, and the church. God, Satan, and the church. God has called the church to enforce his kingdom here on the earth. I want you to think about something. Just, 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 just kind of close your eyes for a second, all right? Think about this. What if Resonate Life Church did not exist? Think about it. Would this community look different? Would... Your life looked different. Maybe God's done something in your life here. Or think about this. What if all the churches in Lucas, Wiley, Princeton, Plano, Allen, Fairview, Murphy, what if they all were shut down? Do you think this community would look different? Think if there was no churches in this community. What would it look like? I mean, that's kind of scary to think about. We would see... Society would change. There'd be no churches praying and interceding for their neighbors. We'd see uh, no churches preaching the gospel. No, no churches taking care of the poor and the hurting. No church pouring into the next generation. In one generation, if there was no church, there would be total apathy and depravity in our, in our, um, in our society. Why? Because that's the role of the church. We are pushing, we're keeping darkness at bay and we're advancing against it. And if we don't take our place, the enemy 
comes in. And really, if you think about it, it's happening, you know, it's already happening. It's happening around the nation. It's because the church hasn't taken its place. It's caved to the culture, and it's not standing up for righteousness. So take your place can mean all kinds of things. Take your place may mean share the gospel with your neighbor. It could mean um, just going, ne- going out on a, on a, you know, to share evangelism like we've done. Take your place could mean running for the school board or the city council. Your one vote might be the, the thing that keeps evil at bay. Come on. Yeah, right. Take your place might mean serving in the kids' ministry or the, the youth ministry. Do you understand? Taking your place in that place could literally change a kid's life. Yeah. That kid could come to the Lord. That kid may make a different choice of who they marry because you're in their life. That kid may make a different choice about how they raise their children because they've seen a godly marriage and a godly family in in their own life and they've never had that in their life and you change their life. Come on, I mean, the stakes are high. Taking your space isn't just filling the space either. It's walking in authority God has given you. It's not just being present, dads. It's leading. Not just being present, it's leading. And I'm being honest, I'm going to say something. This is what area I have struggled in in my own life. Um, I remember especially early on in parenting, you know, Sarah would, Sarah would say at times, Jeff, you're here, but you're not here. Anybody had that happen before? You're here, but you're not here. And I would say, well, I, you know, my parents were divorced when I was five. I, I don't have the skills. I don't know what to do, Sarah. I, I don't know how to do it. You know, and it's so long, the excuses only last so long. And she looked at me one day, she said, Jeff, you are the best researcher I know. You got something going on in, in your work, you go and research it. Why don't you go research how to be a dad? And I've had some home runs and I've had some strikeouts. Um, so today, today I just want, I want to discuss, um, we're going to be discussing the obstacles that keep us from taking our place. And there's several of them that we're going to talk about, shame and guilt and distraction. And today we're going to talk about fear. Fear is one of the things that keeps us from uh, taking our place. So we're going to really focus, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be reading a lot in Numbers 13 and 14. We'll get to that in something in, a, in just a second. But fear is something we all deal with, and it's not from God, but it is real. Do you know what the number one, world, worldwide, do you know what the number one fear in the world is? Anybody know? Public speaking. Who's afraid of public speaking? Okay, well, I'm right there with you. I get nervous every time I come up here. I have a huge fear of snakes. Who, who's afraid of snakes? Man, I just can't stand it. Have you heard, did you hear the story on Fox News this week about the lady? Did you read that? Yes. Okay, so she's, I don't know, Idaho or something, ride, five acres riding on her riding lawnmower, it's riding underneath a tree, and a snake falls under from the tree, falls on her head, and then grabs onto her arm and starts wrapping itself around the arm. Meanwhile, a hawk comes down and grabs the snake and is trying to wrestle with the snake off her arm. The snake starts spewing venom at the hawk. Meanwhile, grabbing her arm, she's going, ah! Finally, the hawk grabs it off. She had like all kinds of talon marks all over her. She, she didn't get bit by the snake, but... Whoo! I mean, that's scary. I mean, that is, that is a real fear. That was a fear I didn't even know I had. Now, now I have to, every time I'm walking underneath a tree, I'm like, is there a snake going to fall on me? That's not what I was thinking, but... Oh, my goodness. But, you know... Those fears, they're real, but they don't really drive our daily, daily decisions unless you work for animal control or something. <laughs> but maybe I don't go into high grass or I'm careful or especially... How many times, have you, how many times we say it all the time? There could be snakes in there. I mean, that's just a common saying, right? You know, so, but, but there are fears that guide our daily decisions. And those are the ones we need to look at and be real, um, 
attentive to how those fears are impacting us. You know, have you ever made a decision that you knew was going to alter the course of your life? Like, like I'm going to make this decision. Maybe it's going to college. Okay, when I make this decision, it could alter everything. I'm going here. That I may meet my husband or wife. I may. I mean, this is a decision that's altering uh, your life, and uh, you had to step into a place that you never had to step into before. Anybody ever had that? Well, this week, five years ago, Sarah and I had to step into a place that we didn't, weren't expecting to step into. And uh, five years ago, um, we had to make a, a hard decision and, uh, about becoming the pastors five years ago. To th- this week, actually. It's crazy enough. And uh, so we, about six years ago, the church was, in case you're new, six years ago, the church was a small church. We're still a small church. We're actually considered a mega church now. <laughs> if you're over 200 people, you're now a mega church, uh, apparently. But uh, uh, anyway, six years ago, the church was um, about 20 to 30 people, uh, no kids. I think there was uh, maybe a couple kids, the, the, um, the uh, kids pastor that was part-time had two kids, and that was the kids ministry. And uh, the pastor was a longtime friend of mine, mentor. His name was Ken. His wife was named Jeannie. Some of you guys were around during that time. Sarah and I were pastors in Tucson, uh, worship pastors. And so Ken decided he'd been here for a few years and said, the church is not growing. I don't know what to do. And so he decided, we're going to do a church revitalization. I mean, we're going to completely start from the ground up. We're going to shut down the church for nine months. They shut down the church for nine months. There was no services or ministry. This place was a ghost town. This place was empty for nine months, six years ago. They did a complete renovation of the building, changed the bylaws, changed the leadership structure, everything. And he asked me and Sarah if we would come help him restart this church. And um, he said, I can't pay you, but I'll give you the parsonage. You can stay in the parsonage. And we said, well, that sounds like a good pay right there. But um, we said yes, crazy enough. And we've, ta- we've told this story before, but there was a few things I- I- I'm going to share differently here today. We said yes. We sold our home, with- and the plan was to live off the profit of that home for a year while this church is rebuilt, reestablished, and hopefully we be- become associate pastors to help him lead the church. And so we did that. And we changed the name to, from Faith Fellowship to Resonate Life Church in 2017, September. We launched this church six years ago as, as Resonate Life Church. A year goes by, the church is not growing. Barely, but not enough to hardly even take care of the needs of the community or, or of, the, of the staff or, or, or just the building costs and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, Year goes by, the church's not growing. Me and Sarah, we're out of money. We we've spent everything we have. To, to, you know, this is a this is a big sacrifice, and so we'd spend it all. And we're like, we're, we don't know what else to do. Five years ago, this week, we had the conversation that changed our life. And I want to protect them a little bit, but let me just just say what happened was um, the pastor's wife called us in here on a Tuesday and said, "Hey, want to let you know things are not going well at home." And it's not going to be good. And within one week, everything changed. The pastor and his wife stepped down, left the church, and here we are in a week. And, um, and I want to just say something that I felt like maybe needs to be said. There is no shame, no shame in that. It's actually a brave thing to say, I need help. I need to step away to get some things right. There's no shame in that. The, the, the world makes you think, oh, you failed. No, there's no shame in just saying, you know what? I, we got some stuff that's not working, and it's not good. It's, it's not helpful for the church. It's not helpful for, for, for us. So the elders immediately stepped into action, trying to figure out, what do we do with this church? This was six years ago. And they were deflated. Can you imagine? They had helped shut the church down. They had helped raise thousands of dollars to redo the parking lot they have helped raise 
money to redo, renovate sound uh, children's facility. There was painting and, and cleaning and getting prepared and restructuring the bylaws and, and all of this stuff for less than one year later. It's like, this is it? It's over? Failed? And I understood. Sarah and I were nervous. They weren't even looking at us. We were just associate pastors playing the guitar on. <laughs> so what they did was say, hey, maybe what we should do was find a good church in the area that lines with our values, and we'll just give it to them, and they can, this can become a video venue. You could be watching a video right now. <laughs> Video venue or a multi-site campus, we'll just, we'll just do it. But not, not because they were giving up, just they tried so many times and it just was not working. And so somebody looked at me, a friend of mine says, well, why don't you take, take the church, Jess? I said, I'm not taking the church, I'm not a pastor. I was like, well, you're crazy, I don't want this church. I, I'm just here helping out, trying to figure out where I'm going to go on my next stop. Even though inside I had had, started having, we had been having these, just these thoughts inside like, should, maybe we're supposed to lead church. And God was giving us vision. And, and I had a dream that I've shared before about three months before this that seemed pretty clear. And, and I began to think, man, there's been a church here for over 100 years since 1905. Now that's what, 118? Is that right? Um, 118 years. I'm like, yeah, we can't just give up now there's god wants a church he wants a local church here but i was afraid i was not qualified i didn't go to school for this um i wasn't prepared this was going to take me in a totally different path than i had planned for my life even though i'm i'm glad because this has been a good path it's been it's been god path it's been great but i had all these fears what if i fail all the pastors I have known are good men, but I don't look anything like them, and honestly, I'm not sure I want to look like them. <laughs> no offense to them. I just was like, I'm just different. I, I don't know what to do here. And so I, I'm, I'm really struggling with all of this. And someone spoke a word to me, and he said, you know, Jeff, David was a king. He was a warrior, but he was also a worship leader and a singer, and a songwriter, and a musician, and a shepherd. And when I heard those words, I went, <sighs> maybe God wants to use what I have to lead, and it may look a little different than anything I've done, that I've seen in the past. And so we stepped into our place five years ago, and it's been a great ride, and I'm so glad to be part of what, what God's doing here. I share the good story because that was the success story, but I've got a lot of bad ones. <laughs> Many times that God says, go pray for that person, and you're like, they're going to think I'm weird. Lord, I can't pray for that person. Or, hey, you're in a service and you just feel the call. I'm supposed to give everything. Lord, I give it all away. And then you go look at your bank account, and you're like, Lord, yeah, maybe next week when I get paid. And then you forget the times that I've heard the Lord say, you need to speak up for righteousness. You, need to, you don't need to be afraid, and I've, and I've kept quiet. Or the times where he said, don't go to the church. You need to be present with your kids, and I've still gone anyway. And I failed. So every week we're going to highlight some obstacles that keep us from taking our place. Today we're going to talk about fear. And there's a story in Numbers that I want to talk about that I think is highlights, and you guys probably know where I'm going with it, if you already got your Bibles, you already know what I'm talking about, that highlights one of the obstacles that literally keeps us from stepping into our place. And it's about the Hebrew people. You see, God had given Abraham a promise. About 4,000 years ago, Abraham lived. And God had given him a promise and said, you're going to be a father of a great nation. You're... you're, you're descendants will be more than the sands of the sea I'm giving you and he took him to a piece of land and he said this is the land your descendants will own and it's actually where modern-day Israel is right now 
He says, I'm giving it to you, and I'm going to use this nation to show the world who I am. I'm going to reveal myself through this nation, not because this nation is anything special, just because I'm choosing to use them. I'm going to reveal myself to them. I'm going to reveal how to live, how to be holy, and all this stuff. So Abraham has Isaac, and then Isaac has a son named Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. And in the middle of Jacob's life, God changes his name from Jacob and names him Israel. This is where we get the name Israel is because God changed Israel's name. And Israel's 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. So at the end of Jacob's life, there's this great famine. And they have to move to Egypt. And if you know the story, there's a whole lot of things with Joseph. But they move to Egypt to be safe and have food and all this stuff. And they're taking care of Egypt. There's about 70 of them at the time. Well, 400 years later, the Hebrew people now have multiplied to at least, probably some say, close to 2 million people. And if you think that seems impossible in 400 years, in 1800, there were 1 billion people on the planet here. Now we have close to 9 billion to show you how fast things can change. also shows you how fast we can go from uh, six, six or eight in, in um, Noah and have eight, nine billion people we have today 5,000 years later. God, people, we multiply quick. <laughs> 400 years, they're now two million. The Egyptians are like, these people are so big, we're scared of them, so we're going to make them into slaves and treat them harshly so that they won't go anywhere, and they're going to build Egypt for us. So that begins to happen. And God hears the cries of all the people of Israel. He hears their cries and he raises up someone to deliver them. He raises up a man named Moses. And Moses was a Hebrew, but he, but he, he was born in the, in, the, in the palace and raised by Pharaoh's daughter. But at 80 years old, God calls Moses to be a deliverer. And we could talk about Moses too, about taking his place. He didn't want to take his place out of fear. Oh, Lord, I'm nothing. I don't even have a speak. God said, sorry, I made your mouth. You're going, buddy. So he goes to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, who are you? And you're nuts. There are two million people here. They're great workers for us. I ain't letting you go. And then God, of course, brings these ten plagues. Have you ever seen Ten Commandments? Brings these ten plagues that decimate the land of Egypt, completely destroying it. All things like hail and death and, and uh, um, locusts and you, on and on and on. Decimates the place and Pharaoh says, get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. So what happens? They, they take all two of them, two million of them, you know, take their wives and their children and all their livestock and all their possessions and they start heading out. Headed where? To the promised land that God had given them. 400 years had promised. So they start heading out. And they go about a day's journey or so, and then all of a sudden Pharaoh says, what on earth we did? We just, we just got rid of all our help. And sends his army to go after them. Of course, they get to that place where the Red Sea's in front of them, and then the army's coming after them, and they cry out to God, save us. And God parts the Red Sea, and they walk on dry ground. And when the last Israelites' feet comes off the, the bank, all the, the water comes fl flowing down and kills all the Pharaoh's army. And right then, God does this miracle. And what do they do? They head to the promised land. And this is where I want to pick up the story, but I wanted to give us a little foundation. So now they are at the promised land there at the, the banks, Kadesh Barna, right there at the, at the banks, and they're about to enter the promised land. And let's pick it up and see what happens. Numbers 13. And I'm going to go around just a little bit I use the ESV on this the Lord spoke to Moses saying send men to spy out the land of Canaan which I am giving to the people of Israel from each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man every one of a chief among them verse 17 Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them go up into the Negev and go into the hill country see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak whether they are few or many and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not be of good courage bring some of the fruit of the land now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes so they go out for 40 days this 12 spies numbers 13 verse 25 at the end of 40 days they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness, in Paran and Kadesh. 
They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and show, showed them the fruit of the land. It was these huge grapes. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. That's the giants. The Amalekites, Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. That's the Mediterranean Sea right there. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go against this people. They are stronger than we. So they brought the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we see, saw in it are of great height. There we saw the Nephilim. There's something we could talk about on a different time. But, and we see, seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, so we seem to them. The Nephilim were killed in the flood. I mean, this, this is how much they were exaggerating, the Nephilim. All right? Then all the congregation, verse 14, or, or chapter 14, verse 1, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses. The whole congregation said to them, What would that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, hey, let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. I mean, you could be the best leader in the world and still people turn their backs on you. That'll help some of us. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, had totally different perspectives, though. And I'm going to keep reading a little bit longer. 14, verse 6. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jeph- Jephanuth, however you say that, who, was, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and said to all the congregation of people of Israel, The land which we passed through to spy it out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. I want you to everybody say, Only do not rebel against the Lord. And here, everybody, everybody say this with me. And do not Fear the people of the land. And it says, for they are bread to us. Literally, they are, they are like, we're going to eat them for lunch, is what he's saying. We're going to eat these people for lunch. Listen to this. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to them, said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of the meeting, all the people of Israel. And the people, they didn't want to hear it. They were going to stone them. They had already made up their minds. So what happens? Of course, their lack of faith, their fear. God refuses to let them into the promised land. He says, this generation is going to die out. Forty years later, your children are going to take the land. But you're going to wander in the desert for the next 40 years. Because of their lack of faith and fear, they didn't enter in and take their place. But here's the the interesting thing. We've got to remember, God took care of them. He took care of them. Their sandals didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. He fed them by manna. He fed them by quail. He fed, he made watered papier out of rocks. God took care of his people, even though they disobeyed. That's how good our God is, isn't he? Even when we'd mess it up, he's like, I'm still gonna take care of you. But they missed out. They missed out. And here's the thing I just want to be careful with. I think in our New Testament grace-filled culture, we think, well, God is just sovereign. He's just going to do, he, there's no consequences to our actions. He's, just, he's always working something out. God will give us new opportunities. And there's a lot of truth to that. But sometimes we can let the pendulum swing so far to think, it doesn't really matter what I do anymore. I could just do whatever God's going to work it out. He works all good things out for the good for those who love him and call according to his purposes. There's, we have no part to play. There's no consequences to action. God will always circle back around. He will find a way. But let me just tell you, there's a lot of scriptures that point to our role in the kingdom of God. And if we don't take our role, there are consequences There's consequences when we don't step into our role. Can he raise somebody up? Yeah, but you may miss out on the, the, the thing of God, the joy of God. I mean, listen to this verse right here, Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? 
How can they believe in him if they had never heard of him? How can they hear him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? So this is telling us we got a part to play. If somebody doesn't hear the gospel, it's because someone didn't go and tell them. God, he talks to people by dreams and all that good stuff. Dads, it's easy to say, well, my kids are going to be okay. I turned out all right. I didn't have a dad leading me. Yeah, they will probably turn out okay, but you could have saved them a ton of heartache and broken relationships and set them up to make their mark on the kingdom of God if you would just step into your place. So I want to look at, I want, I want to apply this to our lives, and I'm going to be real quick here. I got four areas of fear that, that grip them that, that, that I want us to apply to our lives. Okay, so number one, they sent out the spies. Number one, they sent out the spies. Now, no, no, this is really interesting. Number says, the Lord says, send out the spies. Okay, so the, it, the, at the beginning of Numbers 1, or 13, verse 1, it says, send out the spies, the Lord says. I was reading this commentary. It's like a 500-year-old commentary by these rabbis. Of course, this is the Torah, so there's a lot of Jewish commentaries. Here's what, here's what they said, and I thought, man, this is interesting, and then they backed it up with Scripture. The Hebrew really says, send yourselves some men. Do it for yourselves if you want to. I'm not commanding you to do so. Now, look, look what Deuteronomy says when Moses is recapping this scenario right here. What's he say? See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go take up possession as the Lord of the God of your fathers has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then, what's it say? Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send, some, send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go in the cities into which we shall come. The thing, this is Moses talking, seemed good to me, and I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe. The Lord did not send them. He said, "If you go ahead and do it. But he says, I'm not sending you. This was actually their downfall. Because God had already told them, the land is exceedingly good, flowing with milk and honey. I've given it to you already. I've already given you everything you need. And they're like, yeah, but we want to go check it out for ourselves. We want to go check it out and make sure that you're right, God. They had more faith in what their eyes were telling them than what God had promised them. We do this all the time. My kids, I, I'm, I, this is one I'm learning. Sorry, I got my kids in here, so I'm learning this. But my kids, well, they, they don't really... They don't really want to have deep discussions with me as a dad. I can see when they roll their eyes... They don't, want to, they don't want to talk to me. They, they don't want to talk to me. No, you step in and you lead. It doesn't matter what, what you have a role as a dad. You step in and you lead. Well, my wife, you know, she's, she's really the spiritual one in the house. And so I, I, I let her kind of do all the spiritual stuff. You know, I, I take care of them. She doesn't really want me to lead in that realm. I can see with my own eyes that she doesn't want to lead. No, it doesn't matter what your eyes see or how she's acting. She's just trying to step in and do the best she can. What she needs you is to step into your place and take the lead. It doesn't matter what her eye, your eyes say. Well... My next door neighbor, he's partying, and he has fun, and he's got money, and he looks like he's having a lot of fun with life. He would never, ever want me to ask him to come to church. That's not the kind of guy he is. And you have no clue the kind of pain he's going through, but your eyes are telling you, and the, whole, the Holy Spirit's saying, go talk to them, but your eyes are deceiving you. He's fine. His life's good. Well, Gen Z, they don't want to hear from me. I'm old and retired. Nobody's, they don't, they don't I, I can see, they, they just kind of pass me as an older, older guy, older woman. They don't want to, I could tell they don't want anything to have for me. It doesn't really matter because the Lord says he needs spiritual dads and moms. You step into your role. You just lead. Take your place. Stop letting your eyes deceive you. Number two. What do we see? Fear of man. Listen to this. However, the people 
who dwell in the land, this is the spies talking, they dwell in the land, are strong, and the cities are fortified very large. Listen to this, and I wish we really could spend the entire day on the fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare. Whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And Luke 12 says this, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after they have nothing more that, that they can do, um, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Whew. What he's saying, he says, you should be way, way more concerned with pleading. With, here we go again, right? You should be way, way more concerned with pleasing God than pleasing man. Amen. Way more concerned. Not even close. You see, the fear of man is putting people, their opinions, their thoughts, their attitudes, even their power above God, above His Word and what God has spoken to you. Putting people on the throne of your heart instead of God, it's making people an idol. It's making their opinions about you an idol. Joshua said, do not fear the people of the land. I tell you what, this is one I have to pray over almost daily. Lord, break this off of me. Break this off of me. Because I struggle a lot. I mean, in the age of cancel culture, it's tough to say anything, right? You speak out against life. You speak out for traditional marriage. You speak against all the craziness that's going on in our land. <sighs> Fear of man. What are they going to say? What are they going to do to me? Some of you are like, I can never go on the outreach like we had last week. I could never go on outreach because, man, I, I, man, people are going to think I'm weird. I'm going to go up to a so, total stranger, and they're going to think I'm weird. Now, I want you to think about this. Step. You, here's how much power this is. This is a total stranger that you don't know, have never met before, probably will never meet again, but yet you are concerned that they think you're weird. What? I could never go knock on a door like we do sometimes and ask people to come to church or pray with them. Oh, they're going to think I'm weird. You care what they think about you? But this is the power of the fear of man. Well, if my house is not perfect, when people come over, you know... Who knows what they're going to think of me? So you exhaust yourself trying to look perfect all the time, you know, because it's that fear of man, fear of what people are going to think of. You walk into a meeting with your peers, and, and you're, you're on the same level with them, but you always feel like a little kid. You always feel less than them. That's the fear of man. Fear of man has to do with, well, I've got to have it all together when I come to church. I gotta, I gotta keep up the image. I come looking like everything's peachy in my life. Until something starts to go wrong, I'm out. I'm out. As soon as there's an issue in my marriage, as soon as my kid stops maybe not behaving perfectly, or a sin issue comes up in my life, I'm out. Why? We remove ourselves literally from a community that loves you, that's praying for you, and has the resources to heal you, all in an effort to keep up an image that everything's looking okay. That makes no sense. But yet it happens all the time. It's the fear of man. It needs to be broken off of us. Fear of man will keep you from God's promises. Keep you from being obedient and keep you from taking your place. You've got to break it off. You've got to break it off of you. We are coming into a world that's going to hate us. They already do. We're coming into a world that's pushing against everything that we stand for as believers. We have got to break this fear of man off of us. And we've got to be strong and we've got to say what's right we got to speak up. We don't have to be mean about it, but we don't have to back down. Lord, break off the fear of man in us. Number three, I call this the fear of the world's systems and structures. 
The cities, they say, are very are fortified and very large, meaning even if we go to fight them, the walls are too high, the walls are too thick, we can't even penetrate into the walls in order to actually go and have a fight with them, so we, we're never going to get in, so we shouldn't go. And here's the idea behind this. It's the idea that says, I'm just a drop in the ocean. What in the world does my voice mean? I have no authority or no power, so I shouldn't even speak up. I'm never going to make an impact on anybody. My industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Me speaking out against abuses, I'm a voice, just a, one voice in the sea of many. Might as well not speak up. My, you know, I'm an outcast Christian at, in my school. Me, I feel like I should start a Bible study, but man, I, nobody's going to care and listen to my voice. My voice doesn't matter. Speak out at a school board meeting. Why? They've already made up their minds. I can't penetrate. They, they already know what they're going to do. Start a small group at a church. Well, I'm an introvert. I'll never, nobody's going to want to come to my group. I, I can't break in. Or maybe it even is just going to a small group or going to some place where you, where you step in and, 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 to, and to meet people. I'm not good at making friends. I'll just stay home. We, we do this on and on and on. I'll never make a difference when it comes to life or sex trafficking or some of the things out there that were right in front of us. I'll never make an impact. So the walls are too fortified. Things are too strong. My voice doesn't matter. And this is the enemy's tactic. Just to get you just saying, your voice is not going to matter. You're not going to make an impact. So just don't even try. And we don't. Maybe you won't change an entire industry or change your school, but you might change one person for Jesus. That's all that matters. Finally, number four, I got to hurry. They said, we look like grasshoppers in their sight. They are giants. And this is a different type of fear because this fear is not based upon their power, but it's based upon your inability or lack. I'm an introvert. I'm not trained to start, to start a Bible study. I don't have all the giftings for it. I, I shouldn't do it. I, you know, I didn't have a dad growing up. I, I, didn't, have, I had a, didn't have a model growing up. So therefore, I'm not equipped to be a good dad. My wife, she, she had a great family growing up. So look, you need to take care of all of this. I'm not equipped to do the stuff. Maybe start a mom's group to pray together. Well, you know, man, my, my, my world, I, I don't have it all together. I, I don't have anything to give. Your insecurity about who you are is keeping you from showing who God is in you. My past disqualifies me. You should have seen who I was. I, I, I'm ashamed of my past. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stay in the background so nobody sees me because I'm ashamed and I feel so bad and I don't even deserve anything. And the enemy speaks the lie, and he speaks the lie, and he speaks the lie. I'm not trained in music. I don't have enough degrees. Let me just tell you, there's people in here and people I run into that have PhDs in theology, and I get a little bit nervous when I get next to them. You heard my story. I wasn't prepared for that. The Lord has just put me in this place. Of course, I study my tail off. I try to read and learn, but here's the point. God didn't choose them. He chose me. And God didn't choose them, He chose you. He equips the called. He equips the called. He knows your lack. He knows your inadequacies. He knows your insecurities. He picked you anyway. It's not about you. And He loves taking people that the world is discarded or thinks of nothing and he loves showing his glory through them. It's like, I love doing that. I showed off. Look what I did through that person. And everybody's like, whoa, you really did something through that person. God doesn't choose you because you're the most talented, the strongest, the perfect person. He chooses because he can trust you to carry his heart. He chooses you because he loves you. And he wants to show his glory through you. So how do we break this off as we end? I'm asked, um, worship team, or just why don't you just come up, Brandon, and just play for a few minutes, and then the worship team can join in a second. How do we break this fear off of us? 
1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Well, this, this scripture is talking really about uh, uh, eternal judgment, and that when Christ's love abounds in you and lives inside of you, you don't have to be afraid of eternal judgment because you know that He's inside you, that He's covering you. But... There's another important truth that I want to speak at, and this is going to be a part of what we're going to do today. When we get a revelation of the love of God for us, that there's nothing that we can do to change, make Him love us more or take love away from us, there's nothing in our past or future we'll do. We are just loved. When we get a revelation of that, when we get a revelation of our love for Him, that he's on the throne of our lives when he becomes the most important you know Jesus says that your love for me should look so strong that any other love for someone else should look like hate when you begin to get a revelation that Lord my life is built around you I don't care what anybody else thinks I just love you with all my heart and then when you get a revelation of his love you being the 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 catalyst or the, or the funnel in which he loves other people. You get a burden for people. You realize it's not about building your empire, acquiring more stuff. It's not about you being comfortable or happy. That your life is actually for bringing people in the kingdom of God and glorifying him. When you recognize those three things, you will blow past all your fears. He loves me. I love him. And people are what matters. So even though I'm afraid, I just blow past it. I'm like, gosh, I'm, it may be uncomfortable for me, but man, this person needs Jesus. And I'm willing to look a little crazy if it means they get to hear the gospel and be changed. The thing that's really interesting about this whole story with the numbers is the exaggeration in which everything is given you know they're, they're giants and all these things about the people in the cities when actual rea reality what they found is that the people of Canaan were, weren't that formidable of, a, of opponent in fact we know in Joshua that the people of Canaan were actually stinking afraid of them God had put this fear upon them everywhere they went they were like ah. but that's what that's what fear does. It exaggerates. Everything's bigger. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. But we know in Timothy that fear is actually a spiritual thing. It says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And, and I just want us to say that there's no real clear dividing line between natural fears and spiritual fears. I don't think there's a real good dividing line, but they're actually intertwined together. And the, act, the enemy uses natural fears. He uses trauma. He uses unforgiveness. And that's the place where he finds a, a foothold in your life to bring fear. Trauma, pain, unforgiveness. They open doorways. And what happens is you begin to believe the lie just like the children of Israel believe. Yeah, it's impossible. And then he's got a stronghold in you. And you just believe everything. And it's irrational. And people are like, why are you so afraid? I, I don't know. It's irrational fears. But God tells us in Scripture about this love. And the, about the spirit of fear and what it's not. He says, God is not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power. What's the opposite? What is fear? It's weakness. It's, I'm weak. I can't do it. It doesn't, it's not about you. It's about Him in you. Yes, I'm, we can't do it. But in you, you can overcome anything in Jesus' name. You, have, you are strong in the Lord. And then He says, love, unforgiveness, bitterness. That becomes the place in which, which the enemy finds a foothold in you. And because really love is all about being safe around people. So, you know, so, you, so when you love them, you feel safe. And when you don't feel safe, that's when things, suspicion and fear become, well, they're going to they're hurt me again. And that person's going to hurt me again. And that person's going to do that again. And, and that's how that always works in my life. And so, so fear is that, ah, 
It's that lack of love and security. And then, of course, sound mind. This is confusion. What's right? What's wrong? I don't know, God. It's confusion. And so God says, that's what the spirit of fear looks like in our life. Weakness, a lack of love. It's bitterness, anger, un un unforgiveness, and pain. And it's confusion. And that's the work of the enemy. And so what I want to do is I'm going to walk us through something. I'm sorry, we're going, just, can, you, can you hang with me about three or four minutes? Yeah. I just want to bow our heads. So we're going to do something real quick. Some of you are battling fear today. Maybe it's one of the fears that I don't add up, that I don't measure up that I don't have the skills maybe you have a fear of man you, it's just running around everywhere on you God wants to break that off it's a spiritual thing now there's two parts to that there's a spiritual thing that need to be broken off and there's a second part where you need to renew your mind and you need to think more like Jesus and you need to speak over him who you are and your identity but we, well, what I want to deal with today is breaking off the spirit of fear it's holding you captive. And if I was on the front row, I would be raising my hand too because this is an area that I have to work on and I'm trying to fight through. I probably every person in this room has an area of fear that they're dealing with. It's spiritual. And it needs us. Sometimes it can be, you know, counseling, all that kind of stuff is great, but when it's a spirit of fear, it needs to be dealt with in a spiritual level with the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for pulling down a stronghold. you got a stronghold of fear. It needs to be broken in Jesus' name. So the first thing I want us to do is I really feel like um, one of the footholds to fear is unforgiveness. So if you're in this room and you're like, I've just got some forgiveness, unforgiveness in my heart that I need to let go. It's pain and it's causing fear to rise up. I've, I've given the enemy a, a foothold, an, an entry. All you're going to do is say, Lord, I forgive that person. So come on, let's just say, Lord, I just forgive them. What, who, somebody's popping in your mind, maybe. Maybe it's yourself. Lord, I just forgive. I just forgive. I release that offense in Jesus' name. I release it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a declaration here. And what I'm going to do is don't be afraid to do what I'm asking you to do. But if you are struggling with a spirit of fear, I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. Stand up right now. Come on. Don't be afraid. It should be almost everybody in this room. Don't be afraid. If you feel like a spirit of fear is, is gripped hold of you, it could be irrational. It could be about death. It could be about the future. I don't know what it is, but a spirit of fear, what we're going to do is we're actually going to cast this thing out. And you're going to use your authority in Jesus to cast this thing out. Bible says we have don't that's not from God so here's what we're going to do so I want you to repeat after me we're going to do it a couple times and we're just going to believe it by spirit I want everybody to say this right now spirit of fear you have no hold on me I take my authority as a follower of Christ and I command you to leave now Let's do it again. Spirit of fear, you have no hold on me. I take my authority as a follower of Christ and I command you to leave now. Okay, now I want you, some, some of you need to get a little angry at what's happening. I mean, angry at the devil, what he's doing. And we need to get a little, little faith rise up in us. Come on, say it right now. Spirit of fear, you have no hold on me. I take my authority as a follower of Christ 
And I command you to leave now. Yes, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give him praise. Sorry, I should have had the worship team up here. We were going we to do a song, but we're, we're running out of time. But what we'll do, I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. Some of you need some, really some deliverance from this issue. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the, wor- the prayer team, I'm sorry, to come up, come up here. And if you're like, I need somebody to pray with me to get this thing broken off for, for me in Jesus' name. You need to come up here and get prayer and, and, and the prayer of agreement. You're going to see some, got some things fall off you. I want to pray for you. I'm going to be down here. If you need prayer, Lord, break this thing off. We're going to pray in Jesus' name that this thing is broken off. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dismiss you as we continue into worship. So, Lord, I pray for every person in this room that is dealing with fear. I pray this thing is broken off for good as they declared it with their mouth. It's done in Jesus' name. And Lord, I I just pray an amazing week, Lord. Go with them, Lord. And I pray that they start to see that fear break off and that they walk in their God-given authority and take their place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to go into worship. We're actually going to sing, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear. So if you want to stay and pray, I'm going to be down here. We're going to pray, but you're formally dismissed.